Section zero of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards, read for LibriVox.org by Mike Harris. Introduction. Goethe, who saw so many things with such clearness of vision, brought out the charm of the popular ballad for readers of a later day in his remark that the value of these songs of the people is to be found in the fact that their motives are drawn directly from nature. And he added that in the art of saying things compactly, uneducated men have greater skill than those who are educated. It's certainly true that no kind of verse is so completely out of the atmosphere of modern writing as the popular ballad. No other form of verse has, therefore, in so great a degree, the charm of freshness. In material, treatment, and spirit, these ballads are set in sharp contrast with the poetry of the hour. They deal with historical events or incidents, with local traditions, with personal adventure or achievement. They are, almost without exception, entirely objective. Contemporary poetry is, on the other hand, very largely subjective, and even when it deals with events or incidents, it invests them to such a degree with personal emotion and imagination, it so modifies and colors them with temperamental effects, that the resulting poem is much more a study of subjective conditions than a picture or drama of objective realities. This projection of the inward upon the outward world, in such a degree that the dividing line between the two is lost, is strikingly illustrated in Maeterlinck's plays. Nothing could be in sharper contrast, for instance, than the famous ballad of The Hunting of the Cheviot and Maeterlinck's Princess Meline. There is no atmosphere in a strict use of the word in the spirited and compact account of the famous contention between the Percys and the Douglases, of which Sir Philip Sidney said, that I found not my heart moved more than with a trumpet. It is a breathless, rushing narrative of a swift succession of events, told with the most straightforward simplicity. In the Princess Meline, on the other hand, the narrative is so charged with subjective feeling, the world in which the action takes place is so deeply tinged with lights that never rested on an actual landscape, that all sense of reality is lost. The play depends for its effect mainly upon atmosphere. Certainly very definite impressions are produced with singular power, but there is no clear, clean stamping of occurrences on the mind. The imagination is skillfully awakened and made to do the work of observation. The note of the popular ballad is its objectivity. It not only takes us out of doors, but it also takes us out of the individual consciousness. The manner is entirely subordinated to the matter. The poet, if there was a poet in the case, obliterates himself. What we get is a definite report of events, which have taken place not a study of a man's mind, nor an account of a man's feelings. The true balladist is never introspective. He is concerned not with himself, but with his story. There is no self-disclosure in his song. To the mood of Senancourt and Amiel he was a stranger. Neither he nor the men to whom he recited or sang would have understood that mood. They were primarily and unreflectively absorbed in the world outside of themselves. They saw far more than they mediated. They recorded far more than they moralized. The popular ballads are, as a rule, entirely free from didacticism in any form. That's one of the main sources of their unfailing charm. They show not only a childlike curiosity about the doings of the day and the things that befall men, but a childlike indifference to moral inference and justification. The bloodier the fray, the better for ballad purposes. No one feels the necessity of apology, either for ruthless aggression or for useless bloodletting. The scene is reported as it was presented to the eye of the spectator, not to his moralizing faculty. He is expected to see and to sing, not to scrutinize and meditate. In those rare cases in which a moral inference is drawn, it's always so obvious and elementary that it gives the impression of having been fastened on at the end of the song, in deference to ecclesiastical rather than popular feeling. The social and intellectual conditions which fostered self-unconsciousness, interest in things, incidents, and adventures rather than in moods and inward experiences, and the unmoral or non-moralizing attitude toward events, fostered also that delightful naivete which contributes greatly to the charm of many of the best ballads, a naivete which often heightens the pathos and at times softens it with touches of apparently unconscious humor. 
the naivete of the child which has in it something of the freshness of a wild flower, and yet has also a wonderful instinct for making the heart of the matter plain. This quality has almost entirely disappeared from contemporary verse among cultivated races. One must go to the peasants of remote parts of the continent to discover even a trace of its presence. It has a real but short-lived charm, like the freshness which shines on meadow and garden in the brief dawn which hastens on to-day. This frank, direct play of thoughts and feeling on an incident, or series of incidents, compensates for the absence of a more perfect art in the ballads, using the word art in its true sense as including complete, adequate, and beautiful handling of subject matter, and masterly working out of its possibilities. These popular songs, so dear to the hearts of the generations on whose lips they were fashioned, and to all who care for the fresh note, the direct word, the unrestrained emotion, rarely touch the highest points of poetic achievement. Their charm lies not in their perfection of form, but in their spontaneity, sincerity, and graphic power. They are not rivers of song, wide, deep, and swift. They are rather cool, clear springs among the hills. In the reactions against sophisticated poetry, which set in from time to time, the popular ballad, the true folk-song, has often been exalted at the expense of other forms of verse. It's idle to attempt to arrange the various forms of poetry in an order of absolute values. It's enough that each has its own quality, and therefore its own value. The drama, the epic, the ballad, the lyric, each strikes its note in the complete expression of human emotion and experience. Each belongs to a particular stage of development, and each has the authority and the enduring charm which attach to every authentic utterance of the spirit of man under the conditions of life. In this wide range of human expression the ballad follows the epic as a kind of aftermath, a second and scattered harvest, springing without regularity or nurture out of a rich and unexhausted soil. The epic fastens upon some event of such commanding importance that it marks a main current of history. Some story, historic or mythologic, some incident susceptible of extended narrative treatment. It is always, in its popular form, a matter of growth, its direct, simple, free from didacticism, representing, as Aristotle says, a single action, entire and complete. It subordinates character to action, it delights in episode and dialogue, it is content to tell the story as a story, and leave the moralization to hearers or readers. The popular ballad is so closely related to the popular epic that it may be said to reproduce its qualities and characteristics within a narrower compass, and on a smaller scale. It is also a piece of the memory of the people, or a creation of the imagination of the people. But the tradition or fact which it preserves is of local rather than national importance. It is indifferent to nice distinctions and delicate gradations or shadings. Its power springs from its directness, vigor, and simplicity. It is often entirely occupied with the narration or description of a single episode. It has no room for dialogue, but it often secures the effect of the dialogue by its unconventional freedom of phrase, and sometimes by the introduction of brief and compact charge and denial, question and reply. Sometimes the incidents upon which the ballad-makers fastened have a unity or connection with each other which hints at a complete story. The ballads which deal with Robin Hood are so numerous and so closely related that they constantly suggest not only the possibility but the probability of epic treatment. It is surprising that the richness of the material, and its notable illustrative quality, did not inspire some earlier Chaucer to combine the incidents in a sustained narrative. But the epic poet did not appear, and the most representative of English popular heroes remains the central figure in a series of detached episodes and adventures, preserved in a long line of disconnected ballads. This apparent arrest in the ballad stage of a story which seemed destined to become an epic naturally suggests the vexed question of the authorship of the popular ballads. They are in a very real sense the songs of the people. They make no claim to individual authorship. On the contrary, the inference of what may be called community authorship is in many instances irresistible. They are the product of a social condition which, so to speak, holds song of this kind in solution, 
of an age in which improvisation, singing, and dancing are the most natural and familiar forms of expression. They deal almost without exception with matters which belong to the community memory or imagination. They constantly reappear with variations so noticeable as to indicate free and common handling of themes of wide local interest. All this is true of the popular ballad, but all this does not decisively settle the question of authorship. What share did the community have in the making of these songs, and what share fell to individual singers? Herder, whose conception of the origin and function of literature was so vitalizing in the general aridity of thinking about the middle of the last century, and who did even more for ballad verse in Germany than Bishop Percy did in England, laid emphasis almost exclusively on community authorship. His profound instinct for reality in all forms of art, his deep feeling for life, and the immense importance he attached to spontaneity and unconsciousness in the truest productivity, made community authorship not only attractive but inevitable to him. In his pronounced reaction against the superficial ideas of literature, so widely held in the Germany of his time, he espoused the conception of community authorship as the only possible explanation of the epics, ballads, and other folk songs. In nature and popular life, or universal experience, he found the rich sources of the poetry whose charm he felt so deeply, and whose power and beauty he did so much to reveal to his contemporaries. Genius and nature are magical words with him, because they suggested such depths of being under all forms of expression, such unity of the whole being of a race in its thought, its emotion, and its action, such entire unconsciousness of self or of formulated aim, and such spontaneity of spirit and speech. The language of those times, when words had not yet been divided into nobles, middle class, and plebeians, was, he said, the richest for poetical purposes. Our tongue, compared with the idiom of the savage, seems adapted rather for reflection than for the senses of imagination. The rhythm of popular verse is so delicate, so rapid, so precise, that it is no easy matter to defect it with our eyes. But do not imagine it to have been equally difficult for those living populations who listened to, instead of reading it, who were accustomed to the sound of it from their infancy, who themselves sang it, and whose ear had been formed by its cadence. This conception of poetry as arising in the hearts of the people, and taking form on their lips, is still more definitely and strikingly expressed in two sentences, which let us into the heart of Herder's philosophy of poetry. Quote, poetry in those happy days lived in the ears of the people, on the lips and in the harps of living bards. It sang of history, of the events of the day, of mysteries, miracles, and signs. It was the flower of a nation's character, language, and country, of its occupations, its prejudices, its passions, its aspirations, and its soul. In these words, at once comprehensive and vague, after the manner of Herder, we find ourselves face to face with that conception not only of popular song in all its forms, but with literature as a whole which has revolutionized literary study in this century, and revitalized it as well. For Herder was a man of prophetic instinct. He sometimes felt more clearly than he saw. He divined where he could not reach results by analysis. He was often vague, fragmentary, and inconclusive, like all men of his type, but he had a genius for getting at the heart of things. His statements often need qualification, but he's almost always on the right track. When he says that the great traditions in which both the memory and the imagination of a race were engaged, and which were still living in the mouths of the people, quote, of themselves took on poetic form, close quote, he is using language which is too general to convey a definite impression of method, but he is probably suggesting the deepest truth with regard to these popular stories. They actually were of community origin. They actually were common property. They were given a great variety of forms by a great number of persons. The forms which have come down to us are very likely the survivors of a kind of informal competition, which went on for years at the fireside and at the festivals of a whole countryside. Barger, whose Lenore is one of the most widely known of modern ballads, 
held the same view of the origin of popular song, and was even more definite in his confession of faith than Herder. He declared in the most uncompromising terms that all real poetry must have a popular origin, quote, can be and must be of the people, for that is the seal of its perfection, close quote. And he comments on the delight with which he has listened in village street and home to unwritten songs, the poetry which finds its way in quiet rivulets to the remotest peasant home. In like manner, Helene Vacaresco overheard the songs of the Romanian people, hiding in the maze to catch the reaping songs, listening at spinning parties, at festivals, at deathbeds, at taverns, taking the songs down from the lips of peasant women, fortune-tellers, gypsies, and all manner of humble folk who were the custodians of this vagrant community verse. We have passed so entirely out of the song-making period, and literature has become to us so exclusively the work of a professional class, that we find it difficult to imagine the intellectual and social conditions which fostered improvisation on a great scale and trained the ear of great populations to the music of spoken poetry. It was almost impossible for us to disassociate literature from writing. There is still, however, a considerable volume of unwritten literature in the world, in the form of stories, songs, proverbs, and pithy phrases, a literature handed down in large part from earlier times, but still receiving additions from contemporary men and women. The unwritten literature is to be found, it's hardly necessary to say, almost exclusively among country people remote from towns, and whose mental attitude and community feeling reproduce, in a way, the conditions under which the English and Scotch ballads were originally composed. The Romanian peasants sing their songs upon every occasion of domestic or local interest, and sowing and harvesting, birth, christening, marriage, the burial, these notable events in the life of the countryside are all celebrated by unknown poets, or rather by improvisers, who give definite form to sentiments, phrases, and words which are on many lips. The Russian peasant tells his stories as they were told to him, those heroic epics whose life is believed in some cases to date back at least a thousand years. These great popular stories form a kind of sacred inheritance bequeathed by one generation to another as a possession of the memory, and are almost entirely unrelated to the written literature of the country. Miss Hapgood tells a very interesting story of a government official stationed on the western shore of Lake Onega, who became so absorbed in the search for this literature of the people that he followed singers and reciters from place to place, eager to learn from their lips the most widely known of these folk-tales. On such an expedition of discovery he found himself, one stormy night, on an island in the lake. The hut of refuge was already full of storm-bound peasants when he entered. Having made himself some tea and spread his blanket in a vacant place, he fell asleep. He was presently awakened by a murmur of recurring sounds. Sitting up he found the group of peasants hanging on the words of an old man, of kindly face, expressive eyes, and melodious voice from whose lips flowed a marvellous song, grave and gay by turns, monotonous and passionate in succession, but wonderfully fresh, picturesque, and fascinating. The listener soon became aware that he was hearing, for the first time, the famous story of Sadko, the merchant of Novgorod. It was like being present at the birth of a piece of literature. The fact that unwritten songs and stories still exist in great numbers among remote country folk of our own time and that additions are still being made to them, help us to understand the probable origin of our own popular ballads, and what community authorship may really mean. To put ourselves even in thought in touch with the ballad-making period of English and Scotch history, we must dismiss from our minds all modern ideas of authorship, all notions of individual origination and ownership of any form of words. Professor Ten Brink tells us that in the ballad-making age there was no production, there was only reproduction. There was a stock of traditions, memories, experiences, held in common by large populations, in constant use on the lips of numberless persons, told and retold in many forms, with countless changes, variations, and modifications, without conscious artistic purpose, with no sense of personal control or possession. 
with no constructive aim either in plot or treatment, no composition in a modern sense of the term. Such a mass of poetic material in the possession of a large community was, in a sense, fluid, and ran into a thousand forms almost without direction or premeditation. Constant use of such rich material gave a poetic turn of thought and speech to countless persons who, under other conditions, would have given no sign of the possession of the faculty of imagination. There was not only the stimulus to the faculty which sees events and occurrences with the eyes of the imagination, but there was also constant and familiar use of the language of poetry. To speak metrically or rhythmically is no difficult matter, if one is in the atmosphere or habit of verse-making. And there is nothing surprising either in the feats of memory or of improvisation performed by the minstrels and balladists of the old time. The faculty of improvising was easily developed, and was very generally used by people of all classes. This facility was still possessed by rural populations, among whom songs are still composed as they are sung, each member of the company contributing a new verse or a variation, suggested by local conditions, of a well-known stanza. When to the possession of a mass of traditions and stories, and of facility of improvisation, is added the habit of singing and dancing, it is not difficult to reconstruct in our own thought the conditions under which popular poetry came into being, nor to understand in what sense a community can make its own songs. In the brave days when ballads were made, the rustic peoples were not mute, as they are today, nor sad, as they have become in so many parts of England. They sang and they danced by instinct, and as an expression of social feeling. Originally the ballads were not only sung, but they gave measure to the dance. They grew from mouth to mouth in the very act of dancing, individual dancers adding verse to verse, and the frequent refrain coming in as a kind of chorus. Gesture, and to a certain extent acting, would naturally accompany so free and general an expression of community feeling. There was no poet, because all were poets. To quote Professor Tenbrink once more, quote, Song and playing were cultivated by peasants, and even by freedmen and serfs. At beer-fests the harp went from hand to hand. Herein lies the essential difference between that age and our own. The result of poetical activity was not the property and was not the production of a single person, but of the community. The work of the individual endured only as long as its delivery lasted. He gained personal distinction only as a virtuoso. The permanent elements of what he presented, the material, the ideas, even the style and the meter, already existed. Quote, the work of the singer was only a ripple in the stream of national poetry. Who can say how much the individual contributed to it, or where in his poetical recitation memory ceased and creative impulse began? In any case, the work of the individual lived on only as the ideal possession of the aggregate body of the people and it soon lost the stamp of originality. In view of such a development of poetry, we must assume a time when the collective consciousness of a people or race is paramount in its unity, when the intellectual life of each is nourished from the same treasury of views and associations, of myths and sagas, when similar interests stir each breast, and the ethical judgment of all applies itself to the same standard. In such an age the form of poetical expression will also be common to all, necessarily solemn, earnest, and simple. End quote. When the conditions which produced the popular ballads became clear to the imagination, their depth of rootage not only in the community life but in the community love became also clear. We understand the charm which these old songs have for us for a later age, and the spell which they cast upon men and women who knew the secret of their birth. We understand why the mistrels of the time, when popular poetry was in its best estate, were held in such honor, why Talifer sang the song of Roland at the head of the advancing Normans on the day of Hastings, and why good Bishop Aldheim, when he wanted to get the ears of his people, stood on the bridge and sang a ballad. These old songs were the flowering of the imagination of the people. They drew their life as directly from the general experience, the common memory the universal feelings, 
as did the Greek dramas in those primitive times, when they were part of rustic festivity and worship. The popular ballads have passed away with the conditions which produced them. Modern poets have, in several instances, written ballads of striking picturesqueness and power. But as unlike the ballad of popular origin as the world of today is unlike the world in which Chevy Chase was first sung, these modern ballads are not necessarily better or worse than their predecessors, but they are necessarily different. It's idle to exalt the wild flower at the expense of the garden flower. Each has its fragrance, its beauty, its sentiment, and the world is wide. In the selection of the ballads which appear in this volume, no attempt has been made to follow a chronological order, or to enforce a rigid principle of selection of any kind. The aim has been to bring within modern compass a collection of these songs of the people, which should fairly represent the range, the descriptive felicity, the dramatic power, and the genuine poetic feeling of a body of verse, which is still, it is to be feared, unfamiliar to a large number of those to whom it would bring refreshment and delight. Written by Hamilton Wright Maybe. End of introduction. Chevy Chase of a Book of Old English Ballads by George Wharton Edwards. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susan Frum. Chevy Chase. God prosper long our noble king, our lives and safeties all. A woeful hunting once there did in Chevy Chase befall. To drive the deer with hound and horn, Earl Percy took his way. The child may rue that is unborn the hunting of that day. The stout Earl of Northumberland a vow to God did make his pleasure in the Scottish woods three summer days to take the chiefest hearts in chevy chase to kill and bear away these tidings to earl douglas came in scotland where he lay who sent earl percy present word he would prevent his sport the english earl not fearing that did to the woods resort with fifteen hundred bowmen bold all chosen men of might who knew full well in time of need to aim their shafts aright. The gallant greyhound swiftly ran to chase the fallow deer. On Monday they began to hunt ere daylight did appear, and long before high noon they had an hundred fat bucks slain. Then, having dined, the drovers went to rouse the deer again. The bowmen mustered on the hills, well able to endure, their backsides all with special care, that day were guarded sure. The hounds ran swiftly through the woods, the nimble deer to take, that with their cries the hills and dales an echo shrill did make. Lord Percy to the quarry went, to view the tender deer, quoth he, Earl Douglas promised this day to meet me here, but if I thought he would not come, no longer would I stay. With that a brave young gentleman thus to the earl did say, Lo, yonder doth Earl Douglas come, his men in armor bright, full twenty hundred Scottish spears, all marching in our sight. All men of pleasant Tividale, fast by the river Tweed, O oh, cease your sport, Earl Percy said, and take your bows with speed. And now with me, my countrymen, your courage forth advance, for never was their champion yet, in Scotland or in France, that ever did on horseback come. But if my hap it were, I durst encounter man for man, with him to break a spear. Earl Douglas, on his milk-white steed, most like a baron bold, rode foremost of his company, whose armor shone like gold. Show me, said he, whose men you be, that hunt so boldly here, that, without my consent, do chase and kill my fallow deer. The man that first did answer make was noble Percy he, who said, We list not to declare, nor shew whose men we be. Yet will we spend our dearest blood, 
thy chiefest heart to slay then douglas swore a solemn oath and thus in rage did say ere thus i will outbraved be one of us two shall die i know thee well an earl thou art lord percy so am i but trust me percy pity it were and great offence to kill any of these our guiltless men for they have done no ill let thou and i the battle try and set our men aside accursed be he earl percy said by whom this is denied then stepped a gallant squire forth witherington was his name who said i would not have it told to henry our king for shame that ere my captain fought on foot and i stood looking on you be two earls said witherington and i a squire alone i'll do the best that do i may while i have power to stand while i have power to wield my sword i'll fight with heart and hand our english archers bent their bows their hearts were good and true at the first flight of arrows sent full fourscore scots they slew yet bides earl douglas on the bent as chieftain stout and good as valiant captain all unmoved the shock he firmly stood his host he parted had in three as leader wear and tried and soon his spearmen on their foes bear down on every side throughout the english archery they dealt full many a wound but still our valiant englishmen all firmly kept their ground and throwing straight their bows away they grasped their swords so bright and now sharp blows a heavy shower on shields and helmets light they closed full fast on every side no slackness there was found and many a gallant gentleman lay gasping on the ground o oh christ it was a grief to see and likewise for to hear the cries of men lying in their gore and scattered here and there at last these two stout earls did meet like captains of great might like lions would they laid on load and made a cruel fight they fought until they both did sweat with swords of tempered steel until the blood like drops of rain they trickling down did feel yield thee lord percy douglas said in faith i will thee bring where thou shalt high advanced be by james our scottish king thy ransom i will freely give and thus report of thee thou art the most courageous knight that ever i did see no douglas quoth earl percy then thy proffer i do scorn i will not yield to any scot that ever yet was born with that there came an arrow keen out of an english bow which struck earl douglas to the heart a deep and deadly blow who never spake more words than these fight on my merry men all for why my life is at an end lord percy sees my fall then leaving life earl percy took the dead man by the hand and said earl douglas for thy life would i had lost my land o christ my very heart doth bleed with sorrow for thy sake for sure a more renowned knight mischance could never take a knight amongst the scots there was which saw earl douglas die who straight in wrath did vow revenge upon the lord Persai, sir hugh montgomery was he called who with a spear most bright well mounted on a gallant steed ran fiercely through the fight and passed the english archers all without all dread or fear and through earl percy's body then he thrust his hateful spear with such a vehement force and might he did his body gore the spear ran through the other side a large cloth yard and more so thus did both these nobles die whose courage none could stain an english archer then perceived the noble earl was slain he had a bow bent in his hand made of a trusty tree 
an arrow of a cloth yard long up to the head drew he against sir hugh montgomery so right the shaft he set the gray goose wing that was thereon in his heart's blood was wet this fight did last from break of day till setting of the sun for when they rung the evening bell the battle scarce was done with stout earl percy there was slain sir john of edgerton sir robert radcliffe and sir john sir james that bold baron and with sir george and stout sir james both knights of good account good sir ralph rabby there was slain whose prowess did surmount for witherington needs must i wail as one in doleful dumps for when his legs were smitten off he fought upon his stumps and with earl douglas there was slain sir hugh montgomery sir charles murray that from the field one foot would never flee sir charles murray of ratcliffe too his sister's son was he sir david lamb so well esteemed yet save it could not be and the lord maxwell in like case did with earl douglas die of twenty hundred scottish spears scarce fifty-five did fly of fifteen hundred englishmen went home but fifty-three the rest were slain in chevy chase under the greenwood tree next day did many widows come their husbands to bewail they washed their wounds in brinish tears but all would not prevail their bodies bathed in purple blood they bore with them away they kissed them dead a thousand times ere they were clad in clay this news was brought to edinburgh where scotland's king did reign that brave earl douglas suddenly was with an arrow slain o oh, heavy news king james did say scotland can witness be i have not any captain more of such account as he like tidings to king henry came within as short a space that percy of northumberland was slain in chevy chase now god be with him said our king sith it will no better be i trust i have within my realm five hundred as good as he yet shall not scots nor scotland say but i will vengeance take i'll be revenged on them all for brave earl percy's sake this vow full well the king performed after at humble down in one day fifty knights were slain with lords of great renown and of the rest of small account did many thousands die thus endeth the hunting in chevy chase made by the earl percy god save our king and bless this land in plenty joy and peace and grant henceforth that foul debate twixt noble men may cease. End of Chevy Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Section two of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Raven Notation. King Cophetua and the Beggar Maid. I read that once in Africa a princely wight did reign, Who had come to name Cophetua, as poets they did feign. From nature's laws he did decline, for sure he was not of my mind. He cared not for women kind, but did them all disdain. But mark what happened on a day, as he out of his window lay, He saw a beggar all in grey the which did cause his pain the blinded boy that shoots so trim from heaven down did high he drew a dart and shot at him in place where he did lie which soon did pierce him to the quick and when he felt the arrow prick which in his tender heart did stick he looketh as he would die what sudden chance is this quoth he that i to love must subject be which never thereto would agree, but still did it defy. Then from the window he did come, and laid him on his bed, 
a thousand heaps of care did run within his troubled head for now he means to crave her love and now he seeks which way to prove how he has fancy might remove and not this beggar wed but cupid had him so in snare that this poor beggar must prepare a salve to cure him of his care or else he would be dead and as he musing thus did lie he thought for to devise how he might have her company that so did amaze his eyes in thee quoth he doth rest my life for surely thou shalt be my wife or else this hand with bloody knife the gods shall sure suffice then from his bed he soon arose and to his palace gate he goes full little then this beggar knows when she the king espies the gods preserve your majesty the beggars all gan cry vouchsafe to give your charity our children's food to buy the king to them his purse did cast and they to part it made great haste this silly woman was the last that after them did hie the king he called her back again and unto her he gave his chain and said with us you shall remain till such time as we die for thou quoth he shalt be my wife and honoured for my queen with thee i mean to lead my life as shortly shall be seen our wedding shall appointed be and everything in its degree come on quoth he and follow me thou shalt go shift thee clean what is thy name fair maid quoth he penelophon o king quoth she with that she made a low curtsy a trim one as i ween thus hand in hand along they walk unto the king's palace the king with courteous comely talk this beggar doth embrace the beggar blusheth scarlet red and straight again as pale as lead but not a word at all she said she was in such amaze at last she spake with trembling voice and said o king i do rejoice that you will take me for your choice and my degree so base and when the wedding day was come the king commanded straight the noblemen both all and some upon the queen to wait and she behaved herself that day as if she had never walked the way she had forgot her gown of grey which she did wear of late the proverb old is come to pass the priest when he begins his mass forgets that ever clerk he was he knoweth not his estate here you may read cofetua though long time fancy fed compelled by the blinded boy the beggar for to wed he that did lovers looks disdain to do the same was glad and fain or else he would himself have slain in story as we read disdain no wit o lady dear but pity now thy servant here lest that it hap to thee this year as to that king it did and thus they led a quiet life during their princely reign and in a tomb were buried both as writers sheweth plain the lords there took it grievously the ladies took it heavily the commons cried piteously their death to them was pain their fame did sound so passingly that it did pierce the starry sky and throughout all the world did fly to every prince's realm end of ballad section 3 of book of english ballads by george edwards read for librivox.org by michael helgens of the watsonfiles.com on may 1st 2010 from cedar rapids iowa king lear and his three daughters king lear once ruled in this land with princely power and peace and had all things with heart's content that might his joys increase amongst those things that nature gave three daughters fair had he so princely seeming beautiful as fair could not be so on a time it pleased the king a question thus to move 
which of his daughters to his grace could show the dearest love. For to my age you bring content, quoth he, then let me hear which of you three is plighted troth. The kindest will appear, to whom the eldest thus began. Dear father mine, quoth she, before your face to do you good, my blood shall rendered be, and for your sake my bleeding heart shall here be cut in twain. Ere that I see your reverend age the smallest grief sustain. And so will I, the second said, dear father, for your sake, the worst of all extremities I'll gently undertake, and serve your highness night and day with diligence and love, that sweet content and quietness discomforts may remove. In doing so you glad my soul, the aged king replied. But what sayst thou, my youngest girl, how is thy love allied? My love, quoth young Cordelia then, which to your grace I owe, shall be the duty of a child, and that is all I'll show. And wilt thou show no more, quoth he, than doth thy duty bind? I well perceive thy love is small, when as no more I find. Henceforth I banish thee, my court, thou art no child of mine, nor any part of this my realm by favour shall be thine. Thy elder sister's loves are more than well I can demand, to whom I equally bestow my kingdom and my land, my pompal state and all my goods that lovingly I may, with those thy sisters be maintained until my dying day. Thus flattering speeches, one renowned by these two sisters here, the third had causeless banishment, yet was her love more dear. For poor Cordelia patiently went wandering up and down, unhelped, unpitied, gentle maid, through many an English town, until at last in famous France she gentler fortunes found. Though poor and bare, yet she was deemed the fairest on the ground, where when the king her virtues heard, and this fair lady seen, with full consent of all his court he made his wife and queen. Her father, old King Lear, this while with his two daughters stayed, forgetful of their promised love, full soon the same decayed. And living in Queen Regan's court, the eldest of the twain, she took from him his chiefest means and most of all his train for whereas twenty men were wont to wait with bended knee she gave allowance but to ten and after scarce to three nay one she thought too much for him so took she all away in hope that in her court good king he would no longer stay am i rewarded thus quoth he in giving all i have unto my children and to beg for what i lately gave i'll go unto my goneril my second child i know will be more kind and pitiful and will relieve my woe full fast he hies them to her court where when she heard his moan returned him answer that she grieved that all his means were gone but no way could relieve his wants yet if that he would stay within her kitchen he should have what scullions gave away when he had heard with bitter tears, he made his answer then, In what I did let me be made example to all men, I will return again, quoth he, unto my Regan's court. She will not use me thus, I hope, but in a kinder sort. Where when he came, she gave command to drive him thence away. When he was well within her court, she said he would not stay. Then back again to Goneril the woeful king did hide that in her kitchen he might have what scullion boys set by but there of that he was denied which she had promised late for once refusing he should not come after to her gate thus twixt his daughters for relief he wandered up and down being glad to feed on beggar's food that lately wore a crown and calling to remembrance then his youngest daughter's words that said the duty of a child was all that love affords but doubting to repair to her whom he had banished so grew frantic mad for in his mind he bore the wounds of woe which made him rend his milk-white locks and tresses from his head and all with blood bestain his cheeks with age and honour spread to hills and woods and watery fonts he made his hourly moan till hills and woods and senseless things did seem to sigh and groan 
Even thus possessed with discontents, he passed o'er to France, in hopes from fair Cordelia there to find some gentler chance. Most virtuous dame, which, when she heard of this her father's grief, as duty bound she quickly sent him comfort and relief, and by a train of noble peers in brave and gallant sort, she gave in charge he should be brought to Aganapus court, whose royal king with noble mind so freely gave consent to muster up his knights at arms to fame and courage bent, and so to England came with speed to repossess King Lear and drive his daughters from their thrones by his Cordelia dear, where she, true-hearted, noble queen, was in the battle stain. Yet he, good king, in his old days possessed his crown again. But when he heard Cordelia's death, who died indeed for love of her dear father, in whose cause she did this battle move, he swooning fell upon her breast from whence he never parted, but on her bosom left his life that was so truly hearted. The lords and nobles, when they saw the end of these events, the other sisters unto death they doomed by consents, and being dead their crowns they left unto the next of kin. Thus have you seen the fall of pride and disobedient sin. End of ballad. This recording is in the public domain. Section 4 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Bridget Tallon Fair Rosamond When as King Henry ruled this land, the second of that name, Besides the Queen, he dearly loved a fair and comely dame. Most peerless was her beauty found, her favour and her face. A sweeter creature in this world could never prince embrace. Her crisped locks, like threads of gold, appeared to each man's sight. Her sparkling eyes, like orient pearls, did cast a heavenly light. The blood within her crystal cheeks did such a colour drive, as though the lily and the rose for mastership did strive. Yea, Rosamond, fair Rosamond, her name was called so, to whom our queen, Dame Eleanor, was known a deadly foe. The king, therefore, for her defence, against the furious queen, at Woodstock builded such a bower, the like was never seen. Most curiously that bower was built of stone and timber strong, and under it and fifty doors did to this bower belong. And they so cunningly contrived, with turnings round about, that none but with a clue of thread could enter in or out. And for his love and lady's sake, that was so fair and bright, the keeping of this bower he gave unto a valiant knight. But fortune, that doth often frown, where she before did smile, the king's delight and lady's joy, full soon she did beguile. For why, the king's ungracious son, whom he did high advance, against his father raised wars within the realm of France. But yet before our comely king the English land forsook, of Rosamond his lady fair, his farewells thus he took. My Rosamond, my only rose, that pleasest best mine eye, the fairest flower in all the world to feed my fantasy, the flower of mine affected heart, whose sweetness doth excel, my royal rose, a thousand times I bid thee now farewell, for I must leave my fairest flower, my sweetest rose a space and cross the seas to famous France, proud revellers to abase. But yet, my rose, be sure thou shalt my coming shortly see, and in my heart, when hence I am, I'll bear my rose with me. When Rosamond, that lady bright, did hear the king say so, the sorrow of her grieved heart, her outward looks did show, and from her clear and crystal eyes the tears gushed out apace which, like the silver pearled dew, ran down her comely face. Her lips, erst like the coral red, did wax both wan and pale, and for the sorrow she conceived, her vital spirits fail. And falling down, all in a swoon before King Henry's face, full oft he in his princely arms her body did embrace. And twenty times, with watery eyes, 
he kissed her tender cheek, until he had revived again her senses mild and meek. Why grieves my rose, my sweetest rose? the king did often say. Because, quoth she, to bloody wars my lord must part away. But since your grace on foreign coasts, amongst your foes unkind, must go to hazard life and limb, why should I stay behind? Nay, rather let me, like a page, your sword and target bear, that on my breast the blows may light, which would offend you there. Or let me in your royal tent prepare your bed at night, and with sweet baths refresh your grace at your return from fight. So I your presence may enjoy, no toil I will refuse, but wanting you my life is death, nay death I'd rather choose. Content thyself, my dearest love, thy rest at home shall be, in England's sweet and pleasant isle, for travel fits not thee. Fair ladies brook not bloody wars, soft peace their sex delights, not rugged camps but courtly bowers, gay feasts, not cruel fights. My rose shall safely here abide, with music pass the day, whilst I among the piercing pikes my foes seek far away. My rose shall shine in pearl and gold, whilst I'm in armour dight. Gay galliards here my love shall dance, whilst I my foes go fight. And you, Sir Thomas, whom I trust to be my love's defence, be careful of my gallant rose, when I am parted hence. And at their parting well they might, in heart be grieved sore. After that day fair Rosamond the king did see no more. For when his grace had passed the seas, and into France was gone, with envious heart Queen Eleanor to Woodstock came anon. And forth she calls this trusty knight in an unhappy hour, who with his clue of twined thread came from this famous bower. And when they had wounded him, the queen this thread did get, and went where Lady Rosamond was like an angel set. But when the queen with steadfast eye beheld her beauteous face, she was amazed in her mind at her exceeding grace. Cast off from thee those robes, she said, that rich and costly be, and drink thou up this deadly draught which I have brought to thee. Then presently upon her knees sweet Rosamond did fall, and pardon of the queen she craved for her offences all. Take pity on my youthful years, fair Rosamond did cry, and let me not with poison strong enforced be to die. I will renounce my sinful life, and in some cloister bide, or else be banished, if you please, to range the world so wide. And for the fault which I have done, though I was forced thereto, preserve my life and punish me as you think meet to do. And with these words her lily hands she wrung full often there, and down along her lovely face did trickle many a tear. But nothing could this furious queen therewith appeased be, the cup of deadly poison strong as she knelt on her knee. She gave this comely dame to drink who took it in her hand, and from her bended knee arose, and on her feet did stand, and casting up her eyes to heaven, she did for mercy call, and drinking up the poison strong, her life she lost withal. And when that death through every limb had showed its greatest spite, her chiefest foes did plain confess she was a glorious white. Her body then they did entomb when life was fled away, at Godstow near to Oxford town, as may be seen this day. End of Ballad This recording is in the public domain. Section 5 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Patty Cunningham Phyllida and Corydon In the merry month of May, in a morn by break of day, with a troop of damsels playing, forth I yod for sooth a maying. When anon by a woodside, where that May was in his pride, I espied all alone Phyllida and Corydon. Much ado there was, God wot, 
He would love, and she would not. She said, Never man was true. He says, None was false to you. He said, He had loved her long. She says, Love should have no wrong. Coridan would kiss her then. She says, Maids must kiss no men, Till they do for good and all. When she made the shepherds call, All the heavens to witness truth, Never loved a truer youth. Then with many a pretty oath, Yea and nay, and faith and troth, Such as seely shepherds use, When they will not love abuse, Love that had been long deluded, Was with kisses sweet concluded, And Phillida with garlands gay, Was made the lady of the May. End of Ballad This section 6 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Stephen Reed Fair Margaret and Sweet William As it fell out on a long summer's day, Two lovers they sat on a hill. They sat together that long summer's day, And could not talk their fill. I see no harm by you, Margaret, And you see none by me. Before to-morrow at eight o' the clock A rich wedding you shall see. Fair Margaret sat in her bower wind, Combing her yellow hair, there she spied sweet William and his bride, As they were riding near. Then down she laid her ivory comb, And braided her hair in twain. She went alive out of her bower, But ne'er came alive in it again. When day was gone, and night was come, And all men fast asleep, Then came the spirit of fair Margaret, And stood at William's feet. Are you awake, sweet William? she said. O oh, sweet William, are you asleep? God give you joy of your gay bride bed, And me of my winding sheet. When day was come and night was gone, And all men waked from sleep, Sweet William to his lady said, My dear, I have cause to weep. I dreamt a dream, my dear lady, Such dreams are never good. I dreamt my bower was full of red wine, And my bride bed full of blood. Such dreams, such dreams, my honoured sir, they never do prove good. To dream thy bower was full of red wine, and thy bride bed full of blood. He called up his merry men all, by one, by two, and by three, saying, I'll away to fair Margaret's bower, by the leave of my lady. And when he came to fair Margaret's bower, he knocked at the ring, and who so ready as her seven brethren to let sweet William in? Then he turned up the covering sheet, Pray let me see the dead, Methinks she looks all pale and wan, She hath lost her cherry red. I'll do more for thee, Margaret, than any of thy kin, For I will kiss thy pale wan lips, Though a smile I cannot win. With that bespake the seven brethren, Making most piteous moan, you may go kiss your jolly brown bride, And let our sister alone. If I do kiss my jolly brown bride, I do but what is right. I ne'er made a vow to yonder poor corpse, By day nor yet by night. Deal on, deal on, my merry men all, Deal on your cake and your wine, For whatever is dealt at her funeral to-day Shall be dealt to-morrow at mine. Fair Margaret died to-day, to-day, Sweet William died the morrow. Fair Margaret died for pure true love, Sweet William died for sorrow. Margaret was buried in the lower chancel, And William in the higher. Out of her breast there sprang a rose, And out of his a briar. They grew till they grew unto the church top, And then they could grow no higher. And there they tied in a true lover's knot, which made all the people admire. Then came the clerk of the parish, And you the truth shall hear, And by misfortune cut them down, Or they had now been there. Section 6 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Stephen Reed End of Ballad Section 7 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Patty Cunningham Anne and Water Anne and Water's wading deep, And my love Annie's wondrous bonny. I will keep my tryst to-night, 
and win the heart, O oh, lovely Annie. He's loopin' on his bonny grey, he raid the right gate and the ready, for a the storm he wadna stay, for seekin' o' oh, his bonny lady. And he is ridden o'er field and fell, through muir and moss and stones and mire, his spurs o' steel were stair to bide, and fray her four feet flew the fire. My bonny grey, no play your part, gin ye be the steed that wins my dearie. We corn and hay ye be fed for I, and never spur sail make you weary. The grey was a mare, and a right good mare, but when she won the annan water, she couldna hae found the ford that night, had a thousand mercs been wadded at her. O oh, boatman, boatman, put off your boat, put off your boat for good and money, but for all the good in fair Scotland, he dared na take him through to Annie. Oh, I was sworn sae late yestereen, not by a single eighth but many, I'll cross the drumly stream to-night, or never could I face my honey. The sight was stay and the bottom deep, frae bank to bray the water pouring, the bonny grey mare she swat for fear, for she heard the water kelpie roaring. He spurred her forth into the flood, I wot she swam both strong and steady, but the stream was broad, her strength did fail, and he never saw his bonny lady. O oh, woe betide the frish sing wand, and woe betide the bush of briar, that bent and brake into his hand, when strength of man and horse did tire. And woe betide ye, Anne and water, this night ye are a drumly river, but over thee will build a bridge, that ye, Neymar, true love may sever. This section eight of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards, read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding. The Bailiff's Daughter of Islington There was a youth, and a well-beloved youth, and he was a squire's son. He loved the bailiff's daughter dear that lived in Islington. Yet she was coy, and would not believe that he did love her so. No, nor at any time would she any countenance to him show. But when his friends did understand his fond and foolish mind, they sent him up to fair London, an apprentice for to bind. And when he had been seven long years, and never his love could see, many a tear have I shed for her sake, when she little thought of me. Then all the maids of Islington went forth to sport and play, all but the bailiff's daughter dear, she secretly stole away. She pulled off her gown of green, and put on ragged attire, and to fair London she would go, her true love to inquire. And as she went along the high road, the weather being hot and dry, she sat her down upon a green bank, and her true love came riding by. She started up with a colour so red, catching hold of his bridle rein. One penny, one penny, kind sir, she said, will ease me of much pain. Before I give you one penny, sweetheart, pray tell me where you were born. At Islington, kind sir, said she, where I have had many a scorn. I prithee, sweetheart, then tell to me, oh, tell me whether you know the bailiff's daughter of Islington. She is dead, sir, long ago. If she be dead, then take my horse, my saddle and bridle also, for I will into some far country where no man shall me know. Oh, stay, oh, stay, thou goodly youth, she standeth by thy side. She is here alive, she is not dead, and ready to be thy bride. Oh, farewell grief and welcome joy, ten thousand times, therefore, for now I have found mine own true love, whom I thought I should never see more. End of Ballad Section 9 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Raven Notation Barbara Allen's Cruelty All in the merry month of May 
when green buds they were swelling, Young Jemmy Grove on his deathbed lay, For love of Barbara Allen. He sent his man unto her then, To the town where she was dwelling, O oh, haste, and come to my master, dear, If your name be Barbara Allen. Slowly, slowly raised she up, And she came where he was lying, And when she drew the curtain by, Says, young man, I think you're dying. Oh, it's I am sick, and very, very sick, And it's all for Barbara Allen. Oh, the better for me ye's never be, Though your heart's blood were spilling. Oh, dinner ye mind, young man, she says, When the red wine ye were filling, That ye made the house go round and round, And ye slighted Barbara Allen. He turned his face unto the wall, And death was with him dealing. Adieu, adieu, my dear friends of, Be kind to Barbara Allen. As she was walking o'er the fields, She heard the dead bell knelling, and every jow the dead bell gave, It cried, Woe to Barbara Allen. O oh, mother, mother, make my bed, To lay me down in sorrow. My love has died for me today, I'll die for him tomorrow. End of Ballad this Section 10 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio the douglas tragedy rise up rise up now lord douglas she says and put on your armour so bright sweet william will hail lady margaret away before that it be light rise up rise up my seven bold sons and put on your armour so bright and take better care of your younger sister for your eldest away the last night He's mounted her on a milk-white steed, and himself on a dapple grey, with a buglet horn hung down by his side, and lightly they rode away. Lord William looked o'er his left shoulder to see what he could see, and there he spied her seven brethren bold come riding o'er the lee. Light down, light down, Lady Margaret, he said, and hold my steed in your hand until that against your seven brethren bold and your father i make a stand she held his steed in her milk-white hand and never shed one tear until that she saw her seven brethren fall and her father hard fighting who loved her so dear oh hold your hand lord william she said for your strokes they are wondrous sir through lovers i can get many a in but a father I can never get mare. Oh, she's ta'en out her handkerchief, it was of the holland sae fine, and aye she dighted her father's bloody wounds that were redder than the wine. Oh, choose, oh, choose, Lady Margaret, he said, oh, whether will ye gang or abide? I'll gang, I'll gang, Lord William, she said, for you have left me nae other guide. He lifted her on a milk-white steed, and himself on a dapple grey, with a buglet horn hung down by his side, and slowly they both rade away. Oh, they rade on, and on they rade, and ah, by the light of the moon, until they came to yon wan water, and there they lighted doon. They lighted doon to take a drink of that spring that ran sae clear, and down the Dream ran his good heart's blood, and sair she gan to fear. Hold up, hold up, Lord William, she says, for I fear that you are slain. Tis naething but the shadow of a scarlet cloak that shines in the water sae plain. Oh, they rade on, and on they rade, and ah, by the light of the moon, until they came to his mother's hall door, and there they lighted doom. Get up, get up, lady mother, he says. Get up and let me in. Get up, get up, lady mother, he says. For this night, my fire lady, I've win. Oh, make me bed, lady mother, he says. Oh, make it braid and deep. And lay lady Margaret close at my back. And the somber I will sleep. 
Lord William was dead, lang ere midnight. Lady Margaret, lang ere day. And all true lovers that go together, may they have mair luck than they. Lord William was buried in St. Mary's Kirk, Lady Margaret in Mary's choir. Out of the lady's grave grew a bonny red rose, and out of the night's a briar. And they twa met, and they twa plat, and fain they wad be near, and all the world might ken rest weel, they were twa lovers dear. But by and away the black Douglas, and wow, oh, but he was rough, for he pulled up the bonny briar and flanked in St. Mary's loch. End of ballad. This recording is in the public domain. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 11 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Young Waters About Yule, when the wind blew cool and the round tables began, Ah, oh, there is come to our king's court mony a well-favoured man. The queen looked o'er the castle wall, beheld baith dale and doon, and then she saw young waters come riding to the town. His footmen they did run before, his horsemen rade behind. Ain mantle of the burning gowd did keep him frae the wind. Gowden graithed his horse before, and siller shod behind the horse young waters rade upon was fleeter than the wind out then spake a wily lord unto the queen said he oh tell me was the fairest face rides in the company i've seen lord and i've seen laird and knights of high degree but a fairer face than young waters mine eyen did never see out then spake the jealous king and an angry man was he oh if he had been twice as fair he might have accepted me you are neither laird nor lord she says but the king that wears the crown there is not a knight in fair scotland but to thee mon bow down for all that she could do or say appeased he would na be but for the words which she had said, young waters, he mon dee. They had ten young waters, and put fetters to his feet. They had ten young waters, and thrown him in dungeon deep. After I have ridden through Stirling town in the wind but on the wheat, but I ne'er rode through Stirling town with fetters at my feet. After have I ridden through Stirling town in the wind but on the rain, but I ne'er rade through Stirling town, near to return again. They hae turned to the heading hill his young son in his cradle, and they hae turned to the heading hill his horse but and his saddle. They hae turned to the heading hill his lady fair to see. And for the words the queen had spoke, young waters, he did dee. End of ballad. Section 12 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Helgens of the Watson Files.com on May 3rd, 2010 from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Flodden Field. King Jimmy hath made a vow, keep it well if he may, that he will be at lovely London upon St. James his day. Upon St. James his day at noon at fair London will I be, and all the lords in merry Scotland, they shall dine there with me. March out, march out, my merry men, of high or low degree, I'll wear the crown in London town, and that you soon shall be. 
Then bespake good Queen Margaret, the tears fell from her eye. Leave off these walls, most noble king, keep your fidelity. The water runs swift and wondrous deep from bottom unto brine. My brother Henry hath men good enough, England is hard to whine. Away, quoth he, with this silly fool, in prison fast let her lie, for she is come of the English blood, and for these words she shall die. With that bespake Lord Thomas Howard, the Queen's Chamberlain, that day. If that you put Queen Margaret to death, Scotland shall rule it alway. Then in a raid King Jamie did say, Away with this foolish mum. He shall be hanged, and the other be burned so soon as I come home. At Floddenfield the Scots came in, which made our Englishmen fain. At Bramstone Green this battle was seen, there was King Jamie slain. His body never could be found when he was overthrown, and he that wore fair Scotland's crown that day could not be known. Then presently the Scot did flee, their cannons they left behind, their engines gay were won all away, our soldiers did bait them blind. To tell you plain, twelve thousand were slain, that to the fight did stand, and many prisoners took that day the best in all Scotland. That day made many a fatherless child, and many a widow poor, and many a Scottish gay lad sate weeping in his boar. Jack with a feather was lapped all in leather, his boastings were all in vain. He had such a chance, with a new Morris dance, he never went home again. This was written to adapt the ballad to the seventeenth century. Now heaven we laud that never more such bidding shall come to hand. Our king by oath is king of both England and fair Scotland. End of ballad. This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Bridget Tallon. Helen of Kirk Connell. I would I were where Helen lies. Night and day on me she cries. Oh, that I were where Helen lies, on fair Kirk Connell Lee. Cursed be the heart that thought the thought, and cursed the hand that fired the shot, when in my arms bird Helen dropped, and died to succour me. Oh, think now but my heart was sere, when my love dropped, and spack no mare, I laid her down with makely care, on fair Kirk Connell Lee. As I went down the water side, none but my foe to be my guide, none but my foe to be my guide, on fair Kirk Connell Lee. I lighted down my sword to draw, I hacked him in pieces small, I hacked him in pieces small, for her sake that died for me. O Helen fair beyond compare, I'll make a garland of thy hair, shall bind my heart for ever mare until the day I dee. O that I were where Helen lies, night and day on me she cries, out of my bed she bids me rise, says haste and come to me. O Helen fair, O Helen chaste, if I were with thee I were blessed, where thou lies low and takes thy rest on fair Kirk Connell Lee. I would my grave were growing green, a winding sheet drawn o'er mine een, and I in Helen's arms lying, on fair Kirk Connell Lee. I would I were where Helen lies, night and day on me she cries, and I am weary of the skies, since my love died for me. End of Ballad Section 14 Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Serenka Robin Hood and Allan a Dale Come listen to me, you gallants so free, All you that love mirth for to hear, And I will tell you of a bold outlaw That lived in Nottinghamshire. As Robin Hood in the forest stood, All under the greenwood tree, there he was aware of a brave young man, as fine as fine might be. The youngster was clad in scarlet red, and scarlet fine and gay, and he did frisk it over the plain, and chaunted round a lay. As Robin Hood next morning stood amongst the leaves so gay, there did he espy the same young man come drooping along the way. The scarlet he wore the day before, it was clean cast away, and at every step he fetched a sigh, Alas, and well a day! Then stepped forth brave little John, and midge the miller's son, which made the young man bend his bow, 
when as he see them come. Stand off, stand off, the young man said. What is your will with me? You must come before our master straight under yon greenwood tree. And when he came bold Robin before, Robin asked him courteously, Oh, hast thou any money to spare for my merry men and me? I have no money, the young men said, but five shillings and a ring, and that I have kept the seven long years to have at my wedding. Yesterday I should have married a maid, but she was from me tain, and chosen to be an old knight's delight, whereby my poor heart is slain. What is thy name? then said Robin Hood. Come tell me without any fail. By the faith of my body, then said the young man, my name, it is Allen a Dale. What wilt thou give me, said Robin Hood, in ready gold or fee, to help thee to thy true love again, and to deliver her unto thee? I have no money, then quoth the young man, no ready gold nor fee, but I swear upon a book thy true servant for to be. How many miles is it to thy true love? Come tell me without guile. By the faith of my body, then said the young man, it is but five little mile. Then Robin he hasted over the plain, he did neither stint nor lin, until he came unto the church, where Alan should keep his wedding. What hast thou here? the bishop then said. I prithee now tell unto me. I am a bold harper, quoth Robin Hood, and the best in the north country. A welcome, a welcome, the bishop, he said. That music best pleases me. You shall have no music, quoth Robin Hood, till the bride and bridegroom I see. With that came in a wealthy knight, which was both grave and old, and after him a finikin lass did shine like the glistering gold. This is not a fit match, quoth Robin Hood, that you do seem to make here, for since we are come into the church, the bride shall choose her own dear. Then Robin Hood put his horn to his mouth, and blew blasts two and three, when four and twenty bowmen bold came leaping over the lee. And when they came into the churchyard, marching all in a row, the first man was Alna Dale to give bold Robin his bow. This is thy true love, Robin, he said, young Alan, as I hear say, and you shall be married the same time before we depart away. That shall not be, the bishop, he cried, for thy word shall not stand. They shall be three times asked in the church, as the law is of our land. Robin Hood pulled off the bishop's coat and put it upon little John. By the faith of my body, then Robin said, this cloth doth make thee a man. When little John went into the choir, then people began to laugh. He asked them seven times into church, lest three times should not be enough. Who gives me this maid? said little John, quoth Robin Hood. That do I. And he that takes her from Allen a Dale, full dearly he shall her buy. And then having ended this merry wedding, the bride looked like a queen, and so they returned to the merry green wood amongst the leaf so green. End of ballad. This recording is in the public domain. Section 15 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Patty Cunningham. June 13th, 2010. Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne. When shawls been sheen and shrads full fair, and leaves both large and long, it is merry walking in the fair forest to hear the small bird's song. The wood wheels sang and would not cease, sitting upon the spray, 
so loud he wakened robin hood in the greenwood where he lay now by my fay said jolly robin a sweven i had this night i dreamt me of two weighty yeomen that fast with me can fight methought they did me beat and bind and took my bow me fro if i be robin alive in this land i'll be rokin on them too sweevens are swift master quoth john as the wind that blows o'er the hill for if it be never so loud this night to-morrow it may be still busk ye bone ye my merry men all and john shall go with me for i'll go seek yond white yeomen in greenwood where they be then they cast on their gowns of green and took their bows each one and they away to the green forest a shooting forth are gone until they came to the merry greenwood where they had gladdest to be there were they ware of a white yeoman his body leaned to a tree a sword and a dagger he wore by his side of many a man the bane and he was clad in his capel hide top and tail and mane stand ye still master quoth little john under this tree so green and i will go to yon white yeoman to know what he doth mean ah john by me thou settest no store and that i fairly find how oft send i my men before and tarry myself behind it is no cunning a knave to ken and a man but hear him speak and it were not for bursting of my bow john i thy head would break as often words they breed in bale so they parted robin and john and john is gone to barnesdale the gates he knoweth each one but when he came to barnesdale great heaviness there he had for he found two of his own fell ways were slain both in a slade and scarlet he was flyin afoot fast over stock and stone for the sheriff with seven score men fast after him is gone one shoot now i will shoot quoth john with christ his might and main i'll make yond fellow that flies so fast to stop he shall be fain then john bent up his long bend bow and fettled him to shoot the bow was made of tender bough and fell down to his foot woe worth woe worth thee wicked wood that ere thou grew on a tree for now this day thou art my bale my boot when thou should be his shoot it was but loosely shot yet flew not the arrow in vain for it met one of the sheriff's men good william a trent was slain it had been better of william a trent to have been a bed with sorrow than to be that day in the green wood slade to meet with little john's arrow but as it is said when men be met five can do more than three the sheriff hath taken little john and bound him fast to a tree thou shalt be drawn by dale and down and hanged high on a hill but thou mayst fail of thy purpose quoth john if it be christ his will let us leave talking of little john and think of robin hood how he is gone to the white yeoman where under the leaves he stood good morrow good fellow said robin so fair good morrow good fellow quoth he methinks by this bow thou bears in thy hand a good archer thou shouldst be i am wilful of my way quoth the yeoman and of my morning tide i'll lead thee through the wood said robin good fellow i'll be thy guide i seek an outlaw the stranger said men call him robin hood rather i'd meet with that proud outlaw than forty pounds so good now come with me thou white yeoman and robin thou soon shalt see but first let us some pastime find under the green wood tree first let us some mastery make among the woods so even we may chance to meet with robin hood here at some unset stephen they cut them down two summer shrogs that grew both under a brier and set them three scorth rood in twain to shoot the pricks if fear lead on good fellow quoth robin hood lead on i do bid thee nay by my faith good fellow he said my leader thou shalt be the first time robin shot at the prick he missed but an inch it fro the yeoman he was an archer good but he could never shoot so the second shoot had the weighty yeoman he shot within the garland but robin he shot far better than he for he clave the good prick wand 
A blessing upon thy heart, he said. Good fellow, thy shooting is good. For an thy heart be as good as thy hand, thou wert better than Robin Hood. Now tell me thy name, good fellow, said he, under the leaves of line. Nay, by my faith, quoth bold Robin, till thou have told me thine. I dwell by dale and down, quoth he, and Robin to take I'm sworn, and when I am called by my right name, I am Guy of Good Gisborne. My dwelling is in this wood, says Robin, by thee I set right not. I am Robin Hood of Barnsdale, whom thou so long hast sought. He that had neither been kith nor kin might have seen a full fair sight, to see how together these yeomen went, with blades both brown and bright. To see how these yeomen together they fought, two hours of a summer's day, yet neither Robin Hood nor Sir Guy them fettled to fly away. Robin was reachless on a root, and stumbled at that tide, and Guy was quick and nimble withal, and hit him o'er the left side. Ah, oh, dear lady, said Robin Hood, though, thou art but mother and may. I think it was never a man's destiny to die before his day. Robin thought on Our Lady dear, and soon leapt up again, and straight he came with a backward stroke, and he Sir Guy hath slain. He took Sir Guy's head by the hair, and stuck it upon his bow's end. Thou hast been a traitor all thy life, which thing must have an end. Robin pulled forth an Irish knife, and nicked Sir Guy in the face, that he was never on woman born, could tell whose head it was. Says, Lie there, lie there now, Sir Guy, and with me be not wroth. If thou have had the worst strokes at my hand, thou shalt have the better clothe. Robin did off his gown of green, and on Sir Guy did throw, and he put on that capul hide that clad him top to toe. The bow, the arrows, and little horn, now with me I will bear, for I will away to Barnsdale to see how my men do fare. Robin Hood set Guy's horn to his mouth, and a loud blast in it did blow, that be heard the sheriff of Nottingham, as he leaned under a low. Hearken, hearken, said the sheriff, I hear now tidings good, for yonder I hear Sir Guy's horn blow, and he hath slain Robin Hood. Yonder I hear Sir Guy's horn blow, it blows so well in tide, and yonder comes that weighty yeoman, clad in his capel hide. Come hither, come hither, thou good Sir Guy, ask what thou wilt of me. Oh, I will none of thy gold, said Robin, nor I will none of thy fee. But now I have slain the master, he says, let me go strike the knave, for this is all the reward I ask, nor no other will I have. Thou art a madman, said the sheriff, thou shouldst have had a knight's fee. But seeing thy asking hath been so bad, well granted it shall be. When little John heard his master speak, well knew he it was his Stephen. Now shall I be loosed, quoth little John, with Christ his might in heaven. Fast Robin he hide him to little John. He thought to loose him, believe. The sheriff and all his company, fast after him, can drive. Stand aback, stand aback, said Robin. Why draw you me so near? It was never the use in our country, one's shrift another should hear. But Robin pulled forth an Irish knife, and loosed John hand and foot, and gave him Sir Guy's bow into his hand, and bade it be his boot. Then John he took Guy's bow in his hand, his bolts and arrows each one. When the sheriff saw little John bend his bow, he fettled him to be gone. Towards his house in Nottingham town he fled full fast away, and so did all the company, not one behind would stay. But he could neither run so fast, nor away so fast could ride, but little John with an arrow so broad, he shot him into the back side. End of Ballad. This recording is in the public domain. Section 16 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley. Robin Hood's Death and Burial. When Robin Hood and Little John, down a down, a down a down, went o'er yon bank a broom. 
said Robin Hood to Little John, We have shot for many a pound. Hey, down, a down, a down. But I am not able to shoot one shot more. My arrows will not flee. But I have a cousin lives down below. Please, God, she will bleed me. Now Robin is to fair Kirkley gone, as fast as he can win. But before he came there, as we do here, he was taken very ill. And when that he came to fair Kirkley Hall, he knocked all at the ring. But none was so ready as his cousin herself for to let bold Robin in. "'Will you please to sit down, cousin Robin?' she said, "'and drink some beer with me. "'No, I will neither eat nor drink till I am blooded by thee. "'Well, I have a room, cousin Robin,' she said, "'which you did never see, and if you please to walk therein, "'you blooded by me shall be.' She took him by the lily-white hand, and led him to a private room, and there she blooded bold Robin Hood, whilst one drop of blood would run. She blooded him in the vein of the arm, and locked him up in the room. There did he bleed all the live-long day, until the next day at noon. He then bethought him of a casement door, thinking for to be gone. He was so weak he could not leap nor he could not get down. He then bethought him of his bugle-horn, which hung low down to his knee. He set his horn unto his mouth, and blew out weak blasts three. Then little John, when hearing him, as he sat under the tree, I fear my master is near dead, he blows so wearily. Then little John to fair Kirkley is gone, as fast as he can dree. But when he came to Kirkley Hall, he broke locks two or three, until he came bold Robin to. Then he fell on his knee. A boon, a boon, cries little John. Master, I beg of thee. What is that boon? quoth Robin Hood. Little John, thou begst of me? It is to burn fair Kirkley Hall and all their nunnery. Now, nay, now, nay, quoth Robin Hood. That boon I'll not grant thee. I never hurt woman in all my life, nor man in woman's company. I never hurt fair maid in all my time, nor at my end shall it be. But give me my bent bow in my hand, and a broad arrow I'll let flee. And where this arrow is taken up, there shall my grave digged be. Lay me a green sod under my head, and another at my feet, and lay my bent bow by my side, which was my music sweet, and make my grave of gravel and green, which is most right and meet. Let me have length and breadth enough, with a green sod under my head, that they may say, when I am dead, Here lies bold Robin Hood, these words they readily promised him, which did bold Robin please, and there they buried bold Robin Hood, near to the fair Kirklees. End of ballad. This recording is in the public domain. Section 17 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. The Twa Corbies As I was walking all alane, I heard Twa Corbies making the main. The tain unto the thither did say, Where shall we gang and dine the day? O oh, down beside yon old field dyke, I wot there lies a new slain knight, and naebody kins that he lies there but his hawk, his hound, and his lady fair. His hound is to the hunting gain, his hawk to fetch the wild fowl hame. His lady's taen another mate. Say we may make our dinner sweet. Oh, we'll sit on his white house bane, and I'll pike out his bonny blue wine. We a lock o' his golden hair, we'll thick our nest when it blows bare. Monia ain for him makes main, 
but nane shall ken what he is gain over his banes when they are bare the wind shall blow for ever mare section eighteen of a book of old english ballads by george Walton edwards wally wally love thee bonnie a scottish song read for LibriVox.org by jamie on first of june two thousand and ten in manchester england O oh, wally wally up the bank and wally wally down the bray and wally wally yon burnside where i and my love were one to gay i let my back unto an ike i thought it was a trusty tree but first it bowed and saying it brack saying my true love did lightly me O oh, wally wally but jim love be bonny a little time while it is new but when it's old and wax of cold and fades ever like morning dew O oh, wherefore shall I bust my head, and wherefore shall I curl my hair? For my true love has me forsook, and says he'll never love me mare. No earth a seat shall be my bed, the sheets shall near be pressed by me, St. Anson's well shall be my drink, since my true love has forsaken me. My timorous wind, when wilt thou blow, and shake the green leaves off the tree? O oh, gentle death, when wilt thou come? For of my life I am weary. Tis not the frost that pleases fell, nor blowing snares inkle mink. Tis not sick cold that makes me cry, but my love's heart grown cold to me. When me came in my Glasgow town, we were a comely sight to see. My love was clad in black velvet, and I myself in cramacy. For had I wished before I kissed, that love had been so ill to win. I had locked my heart in a case of gold, and pinned it with a silver pin. And oh, but my young babe were born, and set upon the nurse's knee, and I myself a dead and gone, and a green grass growing over me. End of ballad. This recording is in the Section 19 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Mike Harris. The Nut Brown Maid. Be it right or wrong, these men among on women do complain. Affirming this, how that it is a labour spent in vain, To love them well, or for never a deller they love a man again. For let a man do what he can, their favour to attain. Yet if a new do them pursue, their first true lover, Then laboureth for naught, for from her thought he is a banished man. I say not nay, but that all day is both writ and said, That woman's faith is, as who saith, all utterly decayed. But nevertheless right good witness in this case might be laid, That they love true and continue record the nut-brown maid, Which when her love came her to prove to her to make his moan, Would not depart, for in her heart she loved but him alone. Then between us let us discuss what was all the manner, Between them two we will also tell all the pain and fear that she was in. Now I begin. To see that ye may answer. Wherefore all ye that present be, I pray you give an ear. I am the knight, I come by night, as secret as I can. Saying, alas, thus standeth the case, I am a banished man. And she would say, And I your will for to fulfil, in this will not refuse. Trusting to shew in word as few, that men have an ill use, To their own shame women to blame, and causeless them accuse. Therefore to you I answer now, all women to excuse, Mine own heart dear with you that cheer, I pray you, tell and own, For in my heart, of all mankind, I love but you alone. He says, It standeth so, I did it so do, Where of great harm shall grow, My destiny is for to die, A shameful death I trow, Or else to flee the one must be, None other way I know but to withdraw as an outlaw, And take me to my bow. Wherefore adieu, my own heart true, none other read I can, For I must to the greenwood go alone, a banished man. O oh Lord, what is this world this bliss that changeth as the moon? My summer's day in lusty May is darked before the noon. I hear you say farewell, nay, nay, we depart not so soon. Why say ye so, whither will ye go? Alas, what have ye done? All my welfare to sorrow and care Should change if ye were gone, For in my mind of all mankind I love but you alone. I can believe, 
it shall you grieve, and somewhat you distrain. But afterward your pain is hard, within a day or twain, Shall soon a slake, and ye shall take comfort to you again. Why should you what? For, to make thought, your labour were in vain. And thus I do, and pray you to, as heartily as I can, For I must to the greenwood go, alone a banished man. Now sitheth that ye have shewed to me the secret of your mind, I shall be plain to you again, like as ye shall me find. Sith it so that ye will go, I will or not leave behind. Shall never be said the nut-brown maid was to her love unkind. Make you ready, for so am I, although it were unknown, for in my mind of all mankind I love but you alone. Yet I you read to take good heed that men shall think and say, Of young and old it shall be told that ye be gone away. Your wanton will for to fulfil in greenwood you to play, And that ye might from your delight no longer make delay, Rather than ye should thus for me be called an ill woman, Yet would I to the greenwood go alone, a banished man. Though it be sung for old and young that I should be to blame, Theirs be the charge that speaks so large and hurting of my name, for I will prove that faithful love it is devoid of shame, In your distress and heaviness, to part with you the same. And sure, although what do not so, true lovers are they none, For in my mind of all mankind I love but you alone. I counsel you, remember how it is no maiden's law, Nothing to doubt but to run out, to wood with an outlaw. For you must there in your hand bear a bow ready to draw, and as a thief thus must you live, ever in dread and awe, whereby to you great harm might fall, yet had I never then, that I had to the greenwood go alone a banished man. I think not nay, but as ye say, it is no maiden's lore, but love may make me for your sake, as I have said before, to come on foot to hunt and shoot, to get us meat in store, for so that I your company may have, I ask no more from which to part it maketh my heart as cold as any stone, for in my mind of all mankind I love but you alone. For an outlaw this is the law, that men him take and bind, without pity hanged to be, and waver with the wind. If I had need as God forbid, what rescue could ye find? Forsooth I trow you and your bow for fear would draw behind, and no marvel for little avail were in your counsel then. Wherefore I will to the greenwood go alone, a banished man. Right well know ye that women be but feeble for to fight. No woman heeded is indeed to be bold as a knight. Yet in each fear, if that ye were with enemies day and night, I would withstand with bow in hand to grieve them as I might. And you to save, as women have from death men many a one. For in my mind, of all mankind, I love but you alone. Yet take good heed, for ever I dread that you could not sustain the thorny ways, the deep valleys, the snow, the frost, the rain, the cold, the heat, for dry or wet. We must lodge on the plain, and us above none other roof, but a break bush or twain, which soon should grieve you, I believe, and ye would gladly then that I had to the greenwood go alone, a banished man. Sith I have here been party near with you of joy and bliss, I must all's part of your woe endure as reason is. Yet am I sure of one pleasure, and shortly it is this, That where ye be me seemeth barred, I could not fare amiss. Without more speech I you beseech, That we were soon agone, For in my mind of all mankind I love but you alone. If you go thinder ye must consider, when ye have lust to dine, there shall no meat be for you get, nor drink, beer, ale, nor wine. No sheets clean to lie between, made of thread and twine. None other house but leaves and boughs to cover your head and mine. O oh, mine heart, sweet, this evil diet should make you pale and wan. Wherefore I will to the green woods go, alone a banished man. Among the wild deer such an archer as men say that ye be, Ne may not fail of good vital where is so great plenty, And water clear of the river shall be full sweet to me, With which in hell I shall right well endure, as ye shall see. 
and or we go a bit or two can provide anon for in my mind of all mankind i love but you alone lo yet before ye must do more for ye will go with me as cut your hair up by your ear your kirtle by the knee with bow in hand for to withstand your enemies if need be and this same night before daylight to woodward will i flee if that ye will all this fulfil do it shortly as ye can else will i to the greenwood go alone a banished man i shall as now do more for you than longeth to woman head to short my hair a bow to bear to shoot in time of need o oh, my sweet mother before all other for you i have most dread but now adieu i must ensue where fortune doth me lead all this make ye now let us flee the day cometh fast upon for in my mind of all mankind i love but you alone nay nay not so ye shall not go and i shall tell ye why your appetite is to be light of love i well espy for like as ye have said to me in likewise hardly ye would answer whosoever it were in way of company it said of old soon hot soon cold and so is a woman wherefore i to the wood will go alone a banished man if ye take heed it is no need such words to say to me for off ye prayed and long essayed or i you loved pardee and though that i of ancestry a baron's daughter be yet have you proved how i you loved a squire of low degree and ever shall whatso befall to die therefore anon for in my mind of all mankind i love but you alone a baron's child to be beguiled it were a cursed deed to be fellow for an outlaw almighty god forbid yet better were the poor squire alone to forest yeed then ye shall say another day that by my cursed deed ye were betrayed wherefore good maid the best reed that i can is i that to the green would go alone a banished man whatever befall i never shall of this thing you upbraid but if ye go and leave me so then have ye me betrayed remember you well a how that ye dwell a for if ye as ye said be so unkind to leave behind your love the nut-brown maid trust me truly that i shall die soon after you be gone for in my mind of all mankind i love but you alone if that ye went ye should repent for in the forest now i have purveyed me of a maid whom i love more than you another fairer than ever ye were i dare it will avow and you both each should be wroth with other as i trow if it were mine ease to live in peace so will i if i can wherefore i to the wood will go alone a banished man though in the wood i understood ye had a paramour all this may not remove my thought but that i shall be your and she shall find me soft and kind and courteous every hour glad to fulfil all that she will command me to my power for had ye lo an hundred mo of them i would be one for in my mind of all mankind i love but you alone mine own dear love i see the proof that she be kind and true of maid and wife in all my life the best that ever i knew be merry and glad be no more sad the case is changed new for it were ruth that for your truth ye you should have cause to rue be not dismayed whatsoever i said to you when i began i will not to the greenwood go i am no banished man these tidings be more glad to me than to be made a queen if i were sure you should endure but it is often seen when men will break promise they speak the word is on the spleen ye shape some while me to beguile and steal from me i ween then were the case worse than it was and i more woebegone for in my mind of all mankind i love but you alone ye shall not need further to dread i will not disparage you god forbid sith ye descend o oh, so great a lineage now understand to westmoreland which is mine heritage i will you bring and with a ring by way of marriage i will you take and lady make as shortly as i can thus have you won an early son and not a banished man and the author says here ye may see that women be in love meek kind and stable let never man reprove them then or call them variable but rather pray god that we may to them be comfortable 
which sometime proveth such as he loveth, if they be charitable, for sith men would be that women should be meek to them each one, much more ought they to God obey, and serve but him alone. End of the Ballad of the Nut-Brown Maid. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Kalinda. THE FALSE LOVER A fair maid sat in her bower door, wringing her lily hands, and by it came a sprightly youth, fast trippin' o'er the strands. "'Where gang ye, young John?' she says, so early in the day. "'It gars me think by your fast trip your journey's far away.' He turned about with surly look, and said, "'What's that to thee? I'm going to see a lovely maid.' "'Mar fairer far than ye. "'Now how you played me this false love "'in summer mid the flowers, "'I shall repay ye back again "'in winter mid the showers. "'But again, dear love, and again, dear love, "'will ye not turn again? "'For as ye look to other women, "'I shall do to other men. "'Make your choice o' whom ye please, "'for I my choice will have. "'I've chosen a maid more fair than thee, "'I never will deceive. "'But she's killed up clothing fine, "'and after him gaed she, but I, he said, you'll turn again, nay far to go with me. But again, dear love, and again, dear love, will ye never love me again? Alas, for loving you so well, and you na me again. The first in town that they came till, he bought her brooch and ring, but I, he bade her turn again, and gang nay far to with him. But again, dear love, and again, dear love, will ye never love me again? Alas, for loving you so well, and you na me again. The next in town that they came till, he bought her muff and gloves. But I, he bade her turn again, and choose some other loves. But again, dear love, and again, dear love, will ye never love me again? Alas, for loving you so well, and you nay me again. The next in town that they came till, his heart it grew mere fine, and he was deep in love with her, and she was our again. The next in town that they came till, he bought her a wedding gown, and made her lady o' his and bowers in sweet Berwick town. End of ballad. This recording is in the public domain. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 21 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Susan Frum The Mermaid To yon fause stream that near the sea Hides money and elf and plume And rives with fearful din the stains A witless night did come the day shines clear far in his gain war shells are silver bright fishes were loopin ah around and sparklin to the light when as he laved sounds cam sae sweet frae ilka rock and tree the brief was out twas him it doomed the mermaid's face to see Frae neath a rock, soon, soon she rose, and stately on she swam, stopped e the midst, and becked and sang to him to stretch his hand. Gowden glist the yellow links that round her neck she twine, her e'en were o oh, the sky blue, her lips did mock the wine. The smile upon her bonny cheek was sweeter than the bee. Her voice excelled the birdies sang upon the birchen tree. Say, cowthy, cowthy, did she look, and meekle had she fleeched, out shot his hand. Alas, alas, fast in the swirl he screeched. The mermaid looked, her brief was gain. And Kelpie's blast was blowin, full o' she duped, near race again, for deep 
deep was the fawn. Aboon the stream his wraith was seen, while ox tailed lang at gloamin that e'en was coarse, the blast blew hoarse, ere lang the waves were foamin. End of ballad. This recording is in the public domain. Section 22 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Stephen Reed. The Battle of Otterburn. The First Fight. It fell about the Lammas tide when husbands win their hay. The doughy Douglas bound him to ride into England to take a prey. The Earl of Fife, without in strife, he bound him over sole way. The great would ever together ride, that race they may rue for I. Over Ottercap Hill they came in, and so down by Rotherley Crag. Upon Green Leighton they lighted down, strirand many a stag. And boldly brent Northumberland, and harried many a town. They did our Englishmen great wrong, to battle that were not born. They spake a burn upon the bent, Of comfort that was not cold, And said, We have brent Northumberland, We have all wealth in hold. Now we have harried all Bramborishire, All the wealth in the world have we, I read we ride to Newcastle, So still and stall were thee. Upon the morrow when it was day, The standards shone full bright, to the new castle they took the way, and thither they came full right. Sir Henry Percy lay at the new castle, I tell you without and dread, he has been a marchman all his days, and kept Berwick upon Tweed. To the new castle when they came, the Scots they cried on height, Sir Harry Percy, and thou bist within, come to the field and fight, for we have brent Northumberland thy heritage good and right. And sin my lodging I have take, with my brand jumped many a night. Sir Harry Percy came to the walls, the Scottish host for to see, and thou hast brent Northumberland, full sore it rueth me. If thou hast harried all Bramborshire, thou hast done me great envy, for thy trespassed thou hast me done and the one of us shall die. Where shall I bide thee, said the Douglas, or where wilt thou come to me? At Otterburn, in the highway, thou mayest thou well lodged be. The row full reckless there she runs, to make thee game and glee, the falcon and the pheasant both, among the halties on he. There mayest thou have thy wealth at will, well lodged there mayest thou be. It shall not be long ere I come thee till, said Sir Harry Percy. There shall I bide thee, said the Douglas, by the faith of my body. Thither shall I come, said Sir Harry Percy, my troth I plight to thee. A pipe of wine he gave them over the walls, for sooth, as I you say, there he made the Douglas drink, and all his host that day. The Douglas turned him homeward again, forsooth without a nay. He took his lodging at Otterburn upon a Wednesday. And there his fight, his standard down, his getting more and less, and soon he warned his men to go and get their geldings grass. A Scottish knight hooved upon the bent, a watch I dare well say. So was he where on the noble Percy in the dawning of the day. He pricked to his pavilion door, as fast as he might run. Awaken, Douglas, cried the knight, for his love that sits in throne. Awaken, Douglas, cried the knight, for thou mayest waken with wine. Yonder have I spied the proud Percy, and seven standards with him. Nay, by my troth, the Douglas said, but is but a feigned tale. He durst not look on my broad banner, for all England so hail. Was I not yesterday at the Newcastle, that stands so fair on Tyne? 
For all the men the Percy had, He could not gear me once to dine. He stepped out at his pavilion door, To look, and it were less, Array you lordlings, one and all, For here begins no peace. The Earl of Menteith, thou art my Emmy, The ford I give to thee, The Earl of Huntley, court and keen, He shall with thee be. The Lord of Buchan in armour bright, On the other hand he shall be. Lord Johnston and Lord Maxwell, The two shall be with me. Swindon fair field upon your pride, To battle make you bone, Sir Davy Scott, Sir Walter Stewart, Sir John of Angerstone. The Second Fight The Percy came before his host, Which ever was a gentle knight, Upon the Douglas loud did he cry, I will hold that I have height. For thou hast brent Northumberland, And done me great envy, For this traspass thou hast me done, The one of us shall die. The Douglas answered him again, With great words up on he, And said, I have twenty against thy one, Behold, and thou mayst see. With that the Percy was grieved sore, Forsooth, as I you say, He lighted down upon his foot, And shot his horse clean away. Every man saw that he did so, That rail was ever in rout. Every man shot his horse him fro, And light him round about. Thus Sir Harry Percy took the field, Forsooth, as I you say, Jesu Christ in heaven on high Did help him well that day. But nine thousand there was no more, If chronicle will not lane, Forty thousand Scots and four That day fought them again. But when the battle began to join, In haste there came a knight, Then letters fair forth hath he ta'en, And thus he said full right, my lord, your father, he greets you well, With many a noble knight. He desires you to bide, That he may see this fight. The baron of Grastock is come out of the west, With him a noble company. All they lodge at your father's this night, And the battle fain would they see. For Jesus' love, said Sir Harry Percy, That died for you and me, Wend to my lord, my father, again, And say thou saw me not with thee. My troth is plight to yon Scottish knight, It needs me not to lane, That I should bide him upon this bent, And I have his troth again. And if that I wend off this ground, Forsooth unfortune away, He would me call but a coward knight, In his land another day. Yet had I lever to be runned and rent By Mary that mickle may, That ever my manhood should be reproved With a Scot another day. Wherefore shoot archers for my sake, And let sharp arrows flee, Minstrels play up for your warrison, And well quit it shall be. Every man think on his true love, And mark him to the trinity, for to God I make mine a vow, This day will I not flee. The bloody heart in the Douglas's arms, His standard stood on high, That every man might full well know, Besides stood stairs three. The white lion on the English part, For soon as I you sain, The Lukis and the Crescents both, The Scots fought them again. Upon St. Andrew loud did they cry, And thrice they shout on high, And soon marked them on our Englishmen, As I have told you right. St. George the Bright, our Lady's Knight, To name they were full fain, Our Englishmen they cried on height, And thrice they shout again. With that sharp arrows began to flee, I tell you in certain, Men of arms began to join, Many a doughy man was there slain. The Percy and the Douglas met, That either of them was fain, 
They shapped together while that they swept with swords of fine colain. Till the blood from their bassinets ran as the rook doth in the rain. Yield thee to me, said the Douglas, or else thou shalt be slain. For I see by thy bright bassinet thou art some man of might, and so I do by thy burnished brand. Thou art an earl, or else a knight. By my good faith, said the noble Percy, thou hast thou read full right, yet will I never yield me to thee, while I may stand and fight. They swapped together while that they sweat, with swords sharp and long, each on another so fast they beat, till their helms came in pieces down. The Percy was a man of strength, I tell you in this stound, he smote the Douglas at the sword's length, that he felled him to the ground. The sword was sharp, and sore did bite, I tell you in certain. To the heart he did him smite, thus the Douglas was slain. The standard stood still on each side, with many a grievous groan. There they fought the day and all the night, and many a doughy man was slown. There was no friquet that there would fly, but stiffly in stour did stand. A shone hewing on other while they might dry with many a baffle bran. There was slain upon the Scottish side, for sooth and certainly, Sir James of Douglas there was slain that day that he did die. The Earl of Menteith he was slain, grisly groaned upon the ground. Sir Davy Scott, Sir Walter Stewart, Sir John of Angerstone. Sir Charles Murray in that place, that never a foot would fly. Sir Hugh Maxwell, a lord he was, with the Douglas he did die. There was slain upon the Scotty's side, forsooth as I you say, of four and forty thousand Scots went but eighteen away. There was slain upon the English side, forsooth and certainly, A gentle knight, Sir John Fitzhugh, it was more the pity. Sir James Herbotel there was slain, For him their hearts were sore. The gentle Lovell there was slain, That the Percy's standard bore. There was slain upon the English side, Forsooth, as I you say, Of nine thousand Englishmen, Five hundred came away. The others were slain in the field. Christ keep their souls from woe, Seeing there were so few friends Against so many a foe. Then on the morn they made them bears Of birch and hazel grey. Many a widow with weeping tears Their makes they fetch away. This fray began at Otterburn, between the night and the day. There the Douglas lost his life, and the Percy was led away. Then was there a Scottish prisoner taken. Sir Hugh Montgomery was his name. Forsooth, as I you say, he borrowed the Percy home again. Now let us all for the Percy pray, to Jesu most of might, to bring his soul to the bliss of heaven, for he was a gentle knight. End of ballad. Section 23 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Susan Frum. The Lament of the Border Widow. My loof, he built me a bonny bower, and clad it wi' a lily flower, a brower bower ye ne'er did see, than my true loof he built for me. There came a man, by middle day, he spied his sport, and went away, and brought the king that very night, who brake my bower, and slew my knight. He slew my knight, to me so dear, he slew my knight, and poined his gear, my servants all for life did flee, and left me in extremity. I sewed his sheet, making my mane. I watched the corpse, myself alane. I watched his body, night and day. 
no living creature came that way i took his body on my back and whilst i gaed and whilst i sat i digged a grave and laid him in and happed him with the sod so green but think na ye my health was sair when i laid the mowl on his yellow hair think na ye my heart was wae when i turned about away to gae nae living man i love again since that my lovely knight is slain wi a lock of his yellow hair i'll chain my heart for ever mair end of ballad this recording is in the public domain Section 24 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards. Read for LibriVox.org by Bridget Tallon. The Banks of Yarrow. Later, Ian drinking the wine, and ere they paid the lawing, they set a combat them between to fight it in the dawing. What though ye be my sister's lord, we'll cross our swords to morrow. What though my wife your sister be, I'll meet ye then on Yarrow. Oh, stay at hame, my own good lord. O oh, stay my ain, dear Marrow, my cruel brither will you betray on the dowy banks of Yarrow. O oh, fare ye weel, my lady dear, and put aside your sorrow, for if I gay I'll soon return, fra the bonny banks of Yarrow. She kissed his cheek, she camed his hair, as oft she'd done before, oh. She belted him with his good brand, and he's away to Yarrow. When he gaed up the tenny's bank, as he gaed many a morrow, Nine armoured men lay in a den on the dowy braes of Yarrow. O oh, come ye here to hunt or hawk the bonny forest thorough, or come ye here to wield your brand upon the banks of Yarrow? I come not here to hunt or hawk as oft I've done before, oh, but I come here to wield my brand upon the banks of Yarrow. If ye attack me nine to ain, then may God send ye sorrow, yet will I fight while stand I may on the bonny banks of Yarrow. Two has he hurt, and three has slain, on the bloody braes of Yarrow, but the stubborn knight crept in behind and pierced his body thorough. Gay hame, gay hame, you brother John, and tell your sister sorrow to come and lift her leaf of lord on the dowy banks of Yarrow. Her brother John gaed o'er yon hill, as oft he'd done before her. There he met his sister dear come running fast to Yarrow. I dreamt a dream last night, she says. I wish it been a sorrow. I dreamt I put the heather green with my true love on Yarrow. I'll read your dream, sister, he says. I'll read it into sorrow. Your bidden go take up your love, his sleeping sound on Yarrow. She's torn the ribbons fry her head that were breath braid and narrow. She's kilted up her long clothing, and she's away to Yarrow. She's ta'en him in her arms twa, and she given him kisses thorough. She sought to bind his bonny wounds, but he lay dead on Yarrow. Oh, hold your tongue, her father says, and let be all your sorrow. I'll wed you to a better lord than him ye lost on Yarrow. Oh, hold your tongue, father, she says, far worse ye make my sorrow. A better lord could never be than him that lies on Yarrow. She kissed his lips, she caned his hair, as oft she had done before, oh. And there with grief her heart did break upon the banks of Yarrow. End of Ballad Section 25 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Mack Hugh of Lincoln Showing the Cruelty of a Jew's daughter. Four and twenty bonny boys were playing at the bar, and up it stands him, sweet Sir Hugh, the flower among them ah. He kicked the bar there wee his foot, and kept it it wi' his knee, till even at the Jew's window he got the bonny bar flee. Cast out the bar to me, fair maid. Cast out the bar to me. Never a bit, says the Jew's daughter, Till ye come up to me. 
Come up, sweet Hugh, come up, dear Hugh, come up and get the bar. I winna come, I mayna come, without me bonny boy Zaw. She's taen her to the Jew's garden, where the grass grew lang and green. She's put an apple red and white, to wild a bonny boy in. She's wild him in through a chamber, she's wild him in through twa. She's wild him in into the third chamber, and that was the worst of a. She's tied the little boy hands and feet, she's pierced him with a knife, she's caught his heart's blood in a golden cup, and twinned him o oh, his life. She rode him in a cake of lead, bade him lie still in sleep, she cast him in a deep draw well, was fifty fathom deep. When bells were rung and mass was sung, and every bairn went ham, then Ilka Lady had her young son, but Lady Helen had nane. She rode her mantle her about, and sair sergan she weep, and she ran unto the Jews' house, where they were all asleep. My bonny Sir Hugh, my pretty Sir Hugh, I pray thee to me speak. Lady Helen, come to the deep draw well, gin ye your son would seek. Lady Helen ran to the deep draw well, and knelt upon her knee. My bonny Sir Hugh, and ye be here, I pray thee speak to me. The lad is wondrous heavy, mother. The well is wondrous deep. A keen penknife sticks in my heart, and it's hard for me to speak. Gaham, gaham, me mither dear, fetch me my winding sheet, and at the back of Mary Lincoln, it's there we twa shall meet. Now Lady Helen, she's gone him, made him a winding sheet, and at the back of Mary Lincoln, the dead corpse did her meet. And all the balls of Mary Lincoln, without men's hands were wrung, and all the books of Mary Lincoln were read without men's tongue. Never was such a burial since Adam's days begun. End of ballad. This recording is in the public domain. Section 26 of Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Mack Sir Patrick Spens The king sits in Dunfermline town, drinking the blood-red wine. Oh, where will I get a skeely skipper to sail a ship of mine? O up and spack an elder knight, sat at the king's right knee. Sir Patrick Spens is the best sailor that ever sailed the sea. Our king has written a braid letter and seated it with his hand, and sent it to Sir Patrick Spens, who was walking on the strand. To Norway, to Norway, to Norway o'er the fame, the king's daughter of Norway, "'Tis thou, man, bring her him. "'The first word that Sir Patrick read, "'Say loud, loud, laughed he. "'The next word that Sir Patrick read, "'The tear-blinded is he. "'Oh, what is this has done this deed, "'and told the king of me "'to send us out at this time of the year "'to sail upon the sea? "'Be it wind, be it wet, be it hail, be it sleet, our ship must sail a fame, the king's daughter of Norway, tis we much fesher am. They hoist their sails on Monday morn, with all the speed they may, they ha landed in Norway upon a warden's day. They hadna been a week, a week in Norway but tway, when that the lords of Norway began allowed to say, Ye Scottish men spend all our king's gold, and our king's fee, 
Ye lie, ye lie, ye liars loud. Fu lied, I hear ye lie. For I brought as much white money as gain my men and me. And I brought a half fu of good red good out o'er the sea with me. Make ready, make ready, my merry men are. Our good ship sails the morn. Now ever a lake, my master dear, I fear a deadly storm. I saw the new moon late yestereen, what the old moon in her arm, and if we gang to sea, master, I fear we'll come to harm. They hadna sailed a league, a league, a league, but barely three, when the lift grew dark and the wind blew loud, and girly grew the sea. The anchors break and the topmast slap, it was sick a deadly storm, and the waves came over the broken ship, till all her sides were torn. Oh, where will I get a good sailor to take my helm in hand, till I get up to the tall topmast to see if I can spy land? Oh, here I am a sailor good to take the helm in hand, till you go up to the tall topmast, but I fear you'll ne'er spy land. He hadn't again a step, a step, a step, but barely one, when a bout flew out of our goodly ship, and a salt sea it came in. Gay fetch a web of the silken cloth, another o' the twine, and wap them into our ship's side, and let nay the sea come in. They fetched a web of the silken cloth, another o' the twine, and they wapped them round that good ship's side, but still the sea come in. O oh, laith, laith, were our good Scots lords, to weet their cock out shadin, but lying o oh, the play was played, they wat their hats aboon. And money was the feather bed that flattered on the fame, and money was the good lord's son that never mer came hem. The ladies rang their fingers white, the maidens tore their hair. Ah, for the sake of their true loves, for them they'll see nae mair. O oh, lang, lang may the ladies sit, with their fans into their hands, before they see Sir Patrick Spens come sailing to the strand. And lang, lang may the maidens sit, with their good kames in their hair, awaiting for the end their loves, for them they'll see nae mair. O oh, forty miles off Aberdeen, tis fifty fathoms deep, and there lies good Sir Patrick Spens, with a Scots lord at his feet. Section twenty six. Old Book of English Ballads by George Edwards Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Mike End of Ballad This recording is in the public domain